Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us here this morning. My name is Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of the University Express program and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. And we're joined virtually here today with Jenny Ferentino from Wales. Yes. And we're super <laughs> happy to have her. I was hoping to get the last name right this time. Well, you did. <laughs> Well, thank you for being here. And we do have some new folks with us this morning, which is awesome. So I'm just gonna quickly run through my normal housekeeping things. We are recording the session, so I'll try to post it on our website in the near future if all goes as planned. And you have joined muted and without your video showing and you can't do anything about it. You have done nothing wrong. That's just the settings for our program here today. We will be communicating with you through the Q&A panel. So as you go through Jenny's presentation, if you have any questions or comments, type those in right away and we'll try to get through as many as we can in the time that we have this morning. If you join from a laptop or computer, chances are that Q&A panel pops up on the right hand side of your WebEx screen. You may just have to hit the little arrow or carrot to expand it. You'll see your text box and you can send those right to me. My name's Katie, but today I'm Ryan. All right, and you can look in the lower right hand corner of your screen. You should see a question mark in a box. That's your Q&A. Or if you're on a tablet or smartphone, poke or touch your screen. That brings up your control panel. You should see a circle with three dots and then you have Q&A. So we hope you participate with us today. And look at me rhyming. All right, so I'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, which is my Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for everything they do to make the program possible. And as always, we at Senior Services are here for you. If you have questions about program services or benefits, whatever you need, please give us a call. We're 858-8526 and we'll do whatever we can to help you out. All right, Jenny is a graduate of Deuzo College and she has been excited to share her nutrition knowledge with the employees and customers at Wegman Stores throughout Buffalo, New York, <laughs> Erie, Pennsylvania for the last two and a half years. She enjoys learning about new products and sharing how people can incorporate those foods to help them live healthier, better lives. We're happy she's here with us today. Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Katie. I really um, am glad to be with everybody here today on a Bills Win Tuesday. So yay, that's always a great way to start the day, right? Uh, so today I am going to be speaking about omegas and uh, specifically some links to heart health. And I thought since we're nearing the end of the year and the session isn't a full hour, I would also take the opportunity to talk a little bit about goal setting. We'll link it back to the topic omegas, um, but it's great to start thinking about setting goals, if that's something that you, interests you at the beginning of a new year, um, sharing some tips and tricks that we have here at Wegmans for setting goals that become habits that you can keep long term. So we'll be doing that as well at the end today. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. So today, what we're going to talk about, like I said, are um, omega-3s. So hopefully today we're going to uh, learn what omega-3s are, how they help you uh, keep healthy, and food sources of omega-3s and recommendations for intake. So before we start talking about that, we want to talk a little bit about what fat is first. So fat always gets a bad rap. If you were on our last call, we talked a little bit about that. Um, but fat definitely is not all the same and it does play some really important roles in our body. So it helps us to keep our skin healthy. It um, is involved in nerve transmission with our brain. Absorption of vitamins, we talked last time, um, if you remember, and this is always a great time of year to talk about vitamin D. It's a fat soluble vitamin a lot of people take, and you need fat to in, um, in order to absorb that vitamin and utilize it. So it's important for that. Um, and it's also important for the absorption of some plant compounds. Fat also provides energy through calories. We do know that it's calorie dense, um, but it does provide, help us provide energy. It also keeps us full, so it's really important to incorporate fats in our meals to keep us satisfied. Fat um, is comprised of different types of fats. There's saturated, trans fat, and unsaturated fat, and each of them has a different effect on our health. For example, saturated and trans fats can raise our blood cholesterol, uh, specifically that LDL or bad, lousy cholesterol. On the other hand, some unsaturated fats can actually help to reduce our LDL cholesterol. And uh, omega-3s are a type of unsaturated fat. So 
omega-3s are have a unique molecular structure that makes them really fluid. And unlike other fats, they don't get stiff in cold temperatures. So if you think about your stick of butter, once it's in the fridge, it stays nice and solid. If you've ever had a, a dressing or something like that that goes into the fridge and it gets kind of solid and chunky when it's cold, I know that sounds disgusting, but you know what I'm think, talking about. Unsaturated fats, specifically omega-3s, have this unique ability to not solidify when they're cold. And that's really important when you consider the kind of animals that we use for sources of omega-3. So like on the picture here, we have a sockeye salmon. They live and thrive in very, very cold temperatures. So if you think about all the fat that's um, thriving and thriving through them, it's got to stay liquid so that the fish can stay alive and active in its really cold waters. Um, because of that unique molecular structure, um, it plays some really important roles that we'll go into in our body. And you may have also heard of some other omegas. There's omega-6s, which you can find in corn or soy oil. Um, there's also omega-9s in, found in olive oil. There are also types of unsaturated fats, but they have slightly different structures um, that provide different benefits to our body. All unsaturated fats are beneficial for health, but today we're just going to focus on those omega-3s. So we're going to go through a very long list, which is really exciting, of all the different things that um, omega-3s can do for our health. And this list is by no means um, exhaustive. There is so much more that we are learning about omega-3s, and it's really exciting to think about all the different research that's going on and all of the benefits that we know that this one particular nutrient can help us with. So some of the things that we want to think about when we come when it comes to omega threes are um, its ability to promote health for our eyes, brains, and nerves. So omega threes are um, to brains as calcium is to bones. So you think about the structure of bones and how it's really linked to calcium, and that's really what makes it up. Our brains are the same way with omega threes. So if you remove moisture from the brain, about twenty percent of the weight, the structure of the brain, is actually omega threes. So they're really important for our brain health. They make up a good majority of it. Um, omega threes also form the outer covering, our sheath. It's called the sheath of our nerves, and that's really important because without that outer covering. Uh, our nerves would not be able to send signals within our brains, and it wouldn't be able to send signals to other parts of our brains. So that sheath, that protective covering around the nerves is really important for the nerves to be able to send signals. And um, that's really interesting. There's some research going on about um, omega-3s links to brain health and Alzheimer's disease. And I think that that's really kind of based around that nerve structure and its ability to help um, with the, those signaling. Omega-3s also um, promote healthy eyes by protecting against age-related blindness. And there's a lot of research going on about different things that it can do. Cataracts, um, help prevent against cataract, cataracts, macular degeneration, dry eyes, all these different things. And that doesn't stop there. Like I said, there's lots of heart or benefits. Um, Omega-3s are also really important for heart health. So it helps to create, to keep the electrical signals flowing to our heart. It helps us keep a healthy heart rhythm, that low, slow, steady heartbeat that we want to have. They can also bring down um, high levels of triglycerides in our fat, in our uh, bloodstream. And um, we know that we want to not have too much triglycerides in our body. So they're really good for helping to uh, reduce that. And they may also help reduce the risk of a second heart attack. In addition, Omega-3s also um, have the ability to reduce inflammation by keeping the lining of blood vessels smooth and free of damage. And they can also be used to help create substances that fight inflammation and infections. So hopefully with that exhaustive list, you can see all of the really important things that omega-3s do for us. So it's important now to think about different sources of our omega-3s and the different kinds of omega-3s. Sorry, as people walk into it, totally throws me off into the room here. Uh, so omega-3s, there are three different kinds. There's DHA, EPA, and ALA. And they are different forms of omega-3s. They all provide slightly different functions. Um, and they all come from different sources. So as you can see on the screen here, if you have the ability to see that, DHA and EPA, which are really linked to our brain health specifically, there's been a lot of interesting research on DHA specifically, that's those omega-3s that we find in our brains, mostly are made up of DHA. Um, and then the ALA um, is found typically in animal sources. 
ALA is considered an essential fatty acid, which means that our body cannot produce it. We have to consume it through food in order to get um, ALA in our body. Our body does have the unique ability to convert ALA into EPA and subsequently DHA. So they are those two are not considered essential fatty acids. However, research shows that ALA is only converted about four to 9% into DHA and EPA. So really the, um, our body is able to convert it, but not very efficiently. So we do want to consider consuming sources of DHA and EPA in addition, because we know that that conversion in our body is not um, all that great, unfortunately. It, it tries, but it just doesn't succeed sometimes very well. So that's something to think about too. So if we think about ALA, the most common one that we think about as a source is uh, walnuts. So if you look at a package of walnuts, it may say that there's 2,500 milligrams of omega-3s in it. And we know that that's ALA because it's a plant source. Um, and then you may look at a, a package of sardines, which we have on our screen here, those beautiful sardines looking at us. Um, and it may say that it only has 1,500 milligrams of omega-3. So you might think that, that a, uh, the walnuts have more sources of omega-3s in it because it has that higher microgram count. However, because of that conversion factor, the amount of the DHA and EPA that you're ultimately getting is less. So it's important to think of having a variety of foods in our diet because we are going to get a variety of different sources of omega-3s from those foods. So let's talk a little bit about more about those foods. I've kind of already alluded to it, um, but as you can see on the screen here, DHA and EPA are really found in animal products, specifically fatty fishes. So some fatty fishes have more EPA and DHA in them than others. Um, so things like salmon and tuna have a lot of DHA in it, but other sources of seafood have it as well. So tilapia, shrimp, oysters, they all can contain some amount of DHA and EPA, just maybe not as much. And um, while I said that DHA and EPA are really exclusively found in seafood, that's not 100% true. It is also found in some kinds of algae as well, which is because that's the food source of those, that a lot of that seafood. So there's a connection with that in there. Um, with the ALA, that's really going to be our plant-based sources. So I mentioned walnuts are the ones that most people think about when they think about sources of omega-3s. Flaxseed is another um, one that kind of comes to mind for a lot of individuals, but there's a lot of other sources as well. Chia, hemp, also some soybean and canola oil can also have sources of that in there as well. Um, and it can also, both, all three of these can be found in foods that are fortified as well. So if you find a food that is fortified with omega-3s, most likely it has all three components of it in there. Um, something that I always like to mention when I talk about flaxseed is your body doesn't have the ability to um, process flaxseed if it's not broken down. So when you buy the full flaxseed, which is really fun to add to different things, um, your body doesn't actually have the ability to break it down. So buying ground flaxseed is an important way to get the nutrients out of it. Friendly tip, <laughs> get the ground flaxseed. So we've talked about how important omega-3s are for us. We've talked about some sources of omega-3s, but it's now important to think about how much do I actually need? So the Institute of Medicine has determined that about 1,000 to 1,600 milligrams of ALA per day is adequate for healthy adults to prevent deficiency. And a, def a deficiency in omega-3s can really cause rough, scaly skin or a red, swollen, itchy rash, which uh, none of us want. Um, it's important to note that omega-3 deficiency is um, rather um, unheard of in the United States. However, it doesn't... Um, so it, you don't have to worry too much about being um, deficient in it, but it's important to know that um, just because you might not be deficient doesn't necessarily mean that you are getting enough of that ALA to really provide all of the health benefits that omega-3s ha have. So while you might not be deficient, you might not also be consuming enough to really get all of those good benefits that um, the omega-3s can provide to our body. 
So studies also have not um, conclusively determined, unfortunately, what is recommended um, as a level for the ALA to get those healthy benefits. So I mentioned on the last call, I mentioned on every call, the science of food is an ever evolving science, which is super exciting, but also incredibly frustrating when you're looking for answers. Um, we know that there's a benefit. We just don't know how much per day is really um, necessary for you to have of that ALA to get all of those heart healthy benefits. We also don't have a recommendation, unfortunately, yet, but the research is coming uh, for DHA and EPA. However, um, our healthy eating guidelines um, that were released last time in 2015, and they'll be coming out again. Uh, there was a 2020 study that um, just completed. Those results will be um, released next year. Um, but we have always been recommending that you have two four ounce servings of fish per week to get some benefits. And that'll provide roughly 250 milligrams of EPA and DHA with that serving. So, and it's important to note that the recommendation for the two servings of fish per week is not just based on how it would provide you with DHA and EPA. It's really because of that total package of what seafood can provide to us. So in addition to providing those omega-3s, seafood provides protein, vitamins, other vitamins and minerals, and water. Also, we know that individuals who are consuming seafood are often consuming that in replacement of some foods that may be higher in saturated fat, like red meats and pork. And we know that reducing saturated fat intake has some benefits for us as well. So including seafood in our diet is important for a variety of reasons, not only including those omega-3s. Um, and it's important to note that the recommendations that I just kind of talked about are really for healthy individuals. So when you see a recommendation on a food label or you hear about recommendations for daily intake, that's always based on healthy individuals. We know that individuals who have heart disease may require additional omega-3s for heart health. Um, and while I don't um, you intend to talk too much about you know the additional serving that you need to have for heart health if you have heart disease or at an increased risk of it risk of it i would recommend um, going to the american heart association's website and seeing their recommendations on um, omega-3 intake if you do have heart disease so we know that eating seafood is important. We've been talking uh, for years and years and years in the uh, food and nutrition community about increasing our seafood. And if you look at the chart, if you have the ability to see um, that, those blue lines are the recommendations for um, how much uh, fish or seafood you should be eating a day. And notice as we age and based on gender, the amount of seafood that's recommended, uh, the ounces that are recommended does change. So as we um, increase, we usually see a general higher um, need for seafood intake. And then the orange dots are what we actually see on average that we consume. So as we age, we do consume more seafood. And I don't know if you're like me, but I didn't like seafood <laughs> until I hit about 30. Uh, so that's probably why our tastes change as we go older, grow older. And maybe that is something that does um, increase our seafood consumption. But even though we do on average consume more seafood as we age, we definitely fall far below what the recommended amount of seafood intake is. Um, and because we know of all of those important health factors that seafood can contribute to our life, it's really important that we all think about different ways to increase our seafood intake. So what we see on the screen here, and I apologize if you do see the screen, it is a very busy screen. Um, but most importantly, what's on here is a handout that I'll be sending to Katie that she can send to all of you afterwards. And it is sources of omega-3s. On one side of it, there'll be seafood. So that's gonna be our DHA and EPA food sources. And on the other side, it has our plant sources. So those ALA sources. And if you look at the chart for the seafood, um, you can see that they are grouped into different levels of omega-3s per three ounce cooked portion. And that's really because some people are curious on which seafood items offer the most omega-3s. However, um, remember that the dietary guidelines really recommend that you don't have to um, that you just consume seafood, period, two times a week. It's not asking you to consume two high sources of omega-3s. It's just asking that you consume um, omega-3s. But for those who are interested 
there is a breakdown on um, the handout that really kind of talks about what foods provide more omega-3s. Of course, when we talk about seafood intake, we also think about mercury intake. Um, if you're interested in more information about mercury in seafood, there is a great resource on Wegmans.com. I would also recommend checking out the FDA website. They have a very nice chart that talks about the sources of um, seafood and how they are correlated to mercury intake. We, don't want, we do want to be um, cautious of how much mercury we consume because it is toxic to us. Um, foods that are predatory animals, so something like that mackerel that's up there that's high in omega-3s are typically higher in mercury levels as well. So it's just important to balance um, how much seafood you're consuming considering both the omega-3s and the um, mercury level in that seafood. So like I said, I will send this out to Katie so that she can share that with all of you. It's a great resource to have on hand, not only to think about the different sources, but it also gives a variety of different foods to think about when you're considering recipes. So I am, for me, I get stuck on one specific thing. I might eat canned tuna for weeks on end and totally forget about all the different seafood that is out there. So sometimes for me, it's helpful to have a list of all different things. And it's just kind of like a reminder of like, oh yeah, I really do enjoy scallops. And maybe this week I'll incorporate scallops in as well. It's just that reminder of all the different things that you can eat, which is really exciting to always think about all the different things that you can. So I encourage you to think of um, the foods that are out there, both seafood and plant-based, um, and think about all the different ways that you can incorporate those food items into your diet. Um, if anybody has any uh, recipes or different ways that they like to consume that, I encourage you to kind of um, be a little bit interactive within the Q&A session and share your different recipes um, to um, incorporate in those items. Flax um, seed for me, like I said, I like to take the ground flax meal and incorporate that into my yogurt. It provides a slightly different texture and that's a nice way for me to get some flax in. I do cook with canola oil. I love to add walnuts to my yogurt um, in the morning. That was my breakfast, so that's why it's top of mind. Um, but if you have a favorite recipe, please feel free to share it. If you don't have a favorite recipe or maybe you're looking for some inspiration, we do of course have some help at Wegmans.com. So you can visit Wegmans.com and look at all of the different great recipes that we have available um, to follow all the, um, in addition to recipes, if you're not so much a cook, um, if you're like my new husband who cannot cook to save his life, we have our easy meals, um, a lot of different great seafood products that literally are taking off the plastic, stick it in the oven, and you call it a day. Um, if you are confident in your ability to cook, but you maybe want to take your skills to the next level, I also encourage you to check out our pan searing technique. Uh, it's a really great video walked through by uh, one of our cooking coaches, and it just takes you through step by step how to perfectly cook um, seafood, specifically salmon's in that picture here, um, and be really successful with that. I think that sometimes the biggest hurdle that a lot of people have to seafood is they don't know how to prepare it, or every time they've had it prepared, it tastes fishy, or it just stinks up the whole house, or all of these great things. Um, learning some different techniques can really be helpful with it. Pan searing is a great one. Um, also, Cooking from frozen, I think, is really important, too. I buy my seafood in uh, bulk in frozen, so my salmon fillets I buy frozen, and you don't actually have to defrost it. So I find that when I cook it from frozen, I get less of that fishy smell in the house because it just doesn't have that time to come to room temperature and get that stink in the home. So that's my tip for that. If you're in store and you have any questions about it, always talk to one of our chefs in the store. We also have cooking coaches that are um, based out of our meat and seafood department. So whatever Wegman store you shop at, there is a cooking coach in that department. And I'm happy to answer. I can give you the names of the individuals who are there if anybody has a question. Who's my cooking coach? They are very well versed in how to prepare um, all, a whole variety of foods, but specifically seafood as well. So feel free to ask them about their favorite recipes or their favorite way to prepare some seafood. 
So I quickly briefly looked into the chat box and I saw a question about fish oil supplements. So, um, and I didn't read the whole question, but I have a, a some uh, slide here on fish oil supplements. So hopefully that it maybe answers the question. If not, we can go back to it as well. So a lot of people are asking, all right, that's really great that you gave me all that food, but can't I just take a pill? So while there are certain conditions where fish oil supplements might be prescribed for people with certain conditions like heart disease, um, it's unclear if healthy individuals would receive the same benefits from taking a fish oil supplement. So remember that seafood provides nutrients beyond those omega-3s and we need to have all of those different nutrients to have health. So the research is really out as to whether or not healthy individuals taking fish oil supplements will have the same benefits that healthy individuals who consume fish will see. Um, so it's important to think before you start taking a fish oil supplement, is there a reason why you're taking the fish oil supplement? Do you have an allergy to seafood? Um, do you, are you vegan and you just you know don't choose to eat animal products? Talk to your doctor or a healthcare professional before starting a fish oil supplement. And the reason for that is really important. Consuming high amounts of fish oil supplements can lead to thinner blood, which if you're already taking a blood thinner can lead to some really negative interactions. So before taking a fish oil supplement, if that's something you're interested in, talk to your doctor about any potential um, interactions that may have that may e exist. So, of course, in the meantime, the Wegmans Nutrition Team, we're a group of dietitians. We're always going to recommend food first. Um, we know that a, having a healthy pattern of eating is really important for our overall health. But again, if you're interested in a fish oil supplement because consuming fish isn't your thing or because of um, another health condition, just talk to your doctor before you purchase that supplement. So that's a lot about omega threes. Um, what I wanted to do next, because we do have, checking my clock, we do have some time, um, is talk a little bit about goal setting. And the reason I think it's important to talk about goal setting is omega-3s and fish consumption and seafood consumption specifically is something that we know based on the chart that we saw and just by talking to individuals that we all could probably strive uh, to improve on. So setting a goal to meet that um, uh, two servings per week of seafood is a great way to uh, get those heart healthy benefits. But learning tips for goal setting is really important if that's something that you do at any point for any sort of health um, or lifestyle choice that you have. And setting goals is important for anything. So let why not learn a good, useful way to set goals? So, <laughs> so why do we set goals? So goal setting is really important, like I said. It can help you focus. It can provide a target for you to aim for, give you clarity on ultimately what you want, and allow you to concentrate your time and effort. You create accountability for yourself when you set a measurable goal with a deadline. Setting goals can provide motivation, drive you forward, help you make progress towards lasting changes. And I think that's important too. A lot of times we set goals for ourselves um, and we maybe get to that goal, but we didn't do it by setting these small little steps that we talk about. Um, and the goals don't stick. We know that New Year's resolutions, majority of us don't stick with that. And I think by learning this technique, it really makes um, things into habits. So rather than just being like, oh, I got to eat my two servings of seafood this week, got to get it, got to get it. And it's Saturday and you're forcing yourself to eat all of the seafood. It becomes a habit and it becomes second nature and you don't even think about it and you're naturally getting those sources of um, omega-3s and all those great benefits that you're doing or whatever your long-term goal is. So let's talk about what a long-term goal is. The first step is setting that long-term goal. And it's usually um, something that will take several weeks or several months to get to. And once you've established your, what your long-term goal is or what outcome you want to achieve, you can start working on short-term goals that are going to help you get there. So some examples of a long-term goal are, again, things that are going to take some time to get to. So losing 20 pounds will not happen overnight. It's going to take some time. So that could be a long-term goal that you have. Having normal blood pressure, whatever that normal blood pressure level is for you. Losing five inches from your waist. Or in our example that we're going to be talking about today, having two servings of seafood a week. So once we've established what our long-term goal is, we're going to set some a series of short-term goals to get us there. Short-term goals are smaller performance-based goals that lead to an achievement of a long-term goal. It usually takes more than one short-term goal to achieve that long-term goal. And I say goal a lot, and then 
it just stops becoming a word in my mind. So I apologize if it's becoming a weird word in your mind too. <laughs> so picture your long-term goal as uh, the top of a ladder. And obviously you wouldn't stop at the base of the ladder, take one big step up to that top uh, rung. You've got to take little steps along the way to get to that long-term goal. So in thinking about some short-term short goals we can set, we want to start designing SMART goals. And SMART goals really help us um, become um, Set, help short smart goals help those short term goals make sense because I don't know about you but if you've ever set a short term goal of like I'm going to lose weight that doesn't mean anything how do I know when I get there how do I know what the amount of weight is that I want to lose whatever it may be so by setting your goal as a smart goal it helps you create some terms that really help you get to that next level so what is a smart goal it's an acronym. So SMART means, uh, the S is specific. So the goal should be very simple and clear. What are you going to do and how are you going to get there? It should be measurable. It should include concrete numbers so that you know you're on track. How do you know whether or not your goal has been reached? It should be attainable. It should be realistic in your goal setting. Your goal should really be one that you can achieve. And it should be relevant. So if you're thinking about setting a, a short-term goal to help you get to the long-term goal, you wanna make sure that that short-term goal is relevant to what you ultimately want to achieve. And um, is it also important to you as well? So you know, if you're setting a, rel a, a relevant goal, um, but it's not really necessarily related to what your long-term goal is, it's not going to provide you any benefit. It's great probably to do it, but it's not ultimately gonna help you at that end term. And it needs to be time-based. So you have to choose a time frame for you to accomplish that goal. Um, what are you going to do as you set your completion date? So when we think about our SMART goals, um, it's important to maybe write them out. If you're like me, having a visual reminder of what my goal is by writing it out is really important. And there's an easy way that we can think of to write it out. And we um, call it our format X to Y by when. So the X is where you are, the Y is where you want to be, and the when is the specific date. So for example, a short-term goal to eating two servings of seafood a week could be I will eat one tuna entree for lunch by December 15th, 2020. And the X, the where I am, is assuming that I probably don't eat tuna for lunch. Um, so I wanna go from where I currently am of not eating tuna to eating tuna one time a week by December 15th, so by next week. And as we work our way up the ladder, we can set new short-term goals that will help us achieve that long-term goal. So let's say you're starting out with that long-term goal and you don't actually know how to cook <laughs> seafood. So maybe your very first goal, we're gonna start, um, we wanna know that uh, we're gonna start in 2021 going to this long-term goal. So I need to learn how to cook seafood before I can incorporate seafood into my diet. So my first short-term goal is I will watch a video on how to pan sear salmon by January 1st. Once I've learned how to pan sear the salmon, my next goal could be I will make pan seared salmon. The first goal, I don't even need to cook. I just wanna watch the video. Then I'm going to the next week, uh, execute pan searing that salmon. Following that, I'm going to set a short-term goal of eating one seafood dinner each week by January 22nd. And as we move up that ladder, the goals continue to um, shift and eventually, hopefully towards the end, you've reached that long-term goal. And again, by setting these short, small turn, um, short term goals, we are hopefully creating a habit so that by the time we get to that long-term goal, it's not an obligation. It's just something that's natural for us to do. And we've taken little steps to get there that really can help us achieve that habit. And you can think of a variety of different ones in there. Something else that is really important to think about when you're setting your short-term goals. It's like shoulder surgery for me. I don't know why I can't say that. <laughs> um, it's important to think about stumbling blocks. So identifying obstacles that are ahead of you can really help you in um, achieving your goals. If your goal in this example is to cook seafood, consider what knowledge, skills, and resources you have to achieve that goal. Do you know how to cook seafood? Do you have a good pan to cook seafood in? Whatever it may be, identifying what stumbling blocks you might have to get there and then setting a short-term goal to um, achieve and go over that stumbling block. 
Um, maybe it's not the skills, but maybe it's a lack of familiarity with other foods that have omega threes. So one of your short term goals could be to just research different sources of omega threes, and that will give you that knowledge that you need to, to go to a next step of maybe preparing those food items. The idea is really to set up an attainable goal for yourself that you can achieve and help motivate you to take small steps to reach a larger goal. Um, normally, if we were doing this class in person, we would all take time to write down a short term goal, a long term goal and go through that, but we don't have that opportunity to do it in person. Um, so start thinking about different goals that you um, would like to set, whether it's related to omega threes, because that's what we talked about or any goal that you have for yourself, and then start thinking about smart steps to take to get to that long-term goal. If you have any questions um, or want some additional help or feedback, always reach out to our Wegmans Nutrition team that are located in our Customer Care Center, and they can be reached at 1-800-WEGMANS with an extension that's listed on the screen. Um, you can also use the contact us link at Wegmans.com. If you have been to Wegmans.com recently via your computer or your smartphone, you'll know that there's a new chat feature that actually has um, been generated on Wegmans.com. So you can utilize that to um, chat directly with somebody in our customer care center. And if one of the dietitians is in, we'll actually chat with you from there. And of course, I'll provide Katie with my email as well. And you can always email me also. So that is um, my slide presentation for today. I was going to try to figure out how I could go back to the first slide, but I might that might be too complicated for myself. So that is what I had to go through today. Um, and I would love to be able to answer any questions, hopefully that you guys had. Yes, Jenny, thank you so much. We have quite a few questions that came through, actually. Awesome. Um, the first one we'll start with, because you answered the things about the supplements, we had a couple questions about that. Um, okay. The question is, are all brands of canola oil created equal, like Wegmans versus Pops versus Crisco versus Aldi's? So most likely, specifically like, um the generic store brands, those are going to be made by your major major manufacturers. And for the most part, yes, they will all be processed exactly the same way. They might vary um, from batch to batch, from brand to brand slightly, but they'll all provide overall the same general benefits. Okay, thank you. Next thing I'm seeing is, is there a test to see if you're deficient in omegas? Not specifically that I'm aware of, but I would follow up with uh, your doctor to find out. Your body doesn't really necessarily store it except for like in your brain and nobody's going to test your brain for that. Um, but there are ways to test for different fats within your body. Um, and again, based on what your dietary intake is and what your needs are, most medical professionals will be able to determine if you're getting enough omega-3s and whether or not additional food consumption or supplement consumption would be right for you. Okay, thank you. Next, we're seeing are some types of salmon richer in omega threes than others, like farm raised, wild, et cetera. So um, that is not something that I was going to get super into today, but I do know that farm raised versus wild caught is a uh, topic of interest for a variety of reasons. I would direct everybody to go to Wegmans.com. We have a really in depth um, link there about the difference between farm raised and um, and wild cod, there are some differences when it comes to the omegas, but there's also differences in sustainability. So ultimately, I would say that the choosing the difference between the two is really a personal preference based on what is important to you. But I will vary between farm raised and wild caught, honestly, based on the cost of the salmon and what looks good that day. <laughs> Fair enough. Next, how long does ground flax last and should it be refrigerated? Absolutely refrigerate it. So that is, a high, it's a high fat item. So things like flaxseed, also your nuts, um, they will last a lot longer, won't go rancid if you keep them cold. So my flax, I will store in the fridge. My walnuts and um, other nuts, I actually store in the freezer and they last just fine for me in there. Um, I would follow whatever the package recommendation is for expiration days on those. But again, if you keep them in the fridge, they will last longer, stay fresher, and will not um, hopefully go rancid on you and spoil. Hmm. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Next, we touched on this, but maybe there's something else we could add. Uh, what can vegetarians eat instead of fish? Is there anything? 
So for the DHA and EPA, remember that algae is a source of those. So you could consume um, algae, which sounds weird, but there are some really amazing like algae salads. If you ever go to like a sushi restaurant or something like that, that's an option. Um, or again, choosing ALA rich foods. So your nuts, your seeds, your oils that have the ALA in them, your body will convert some of that to DHA and EPA. So incorporate that in as much as you can and you'll get some sources as well. Okay, thank you. Next, is canned tuna good in omegas? So yes, canned tuna, tuna in general, is a source of omega-3s and is a fatty fish. Uh, the important thing to consider when, when choosing in a canned tuna is the kind of tuna that it is. There's sockeye tuna, there's different sources, and those all have different mercury levels. So regardless of the tuna you choose, it's gonna have those omega-3s. Um, but if you're considering mercury in your diet, um, if you again go to the FDA's website, they have a really fantastic chart um, and it breaks down each kind of tun canned tuna as to where they lie with the mercury levels. That would be the main difference. Okay, thank you. Next, we have so glad to know about the Wegmans microwave meals that are actually healthy. Also, love seafood, but rarely cook salmon or scallops because it never quite tastes like the restaurant. I agree. <laughs> Excited to know your chef will give me recipes I can do at home. Who is the chef at the Dick Road store? Thank you. Offhand, the chef, so the chefs all just recently moved, which is so confusing to me, but the cooking coach is Mary Beth. She works out of the meat department. Um, she's there usually not Tuesdays and Wednesdays, um, but Mary Beth is a fabulous resource within the store. So check out her in the meat department, tell her Jenny sent you, and she will hook you up with all those fantastic recipes. Oh, cool, thank you. <laughs> Next I'm seeing, thank you, Jennifer. We didn't know that fish oil supplements causes thinner blood. Yeah, and that's going, I mean, one fish oil supplement probably won't thin your blood to the point where it could be a really big risk factor, but it's really when you're taking a large quantity of it that that can, that risk can be there. So one th supplement, I wouldn't, if you take one today and you're like, oh no, I've thinned my blood, don't fret, it's okay. Um, it's just knowing over time um, that that can, that action can happen and how can it and interact with other medications that you're taking. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Next, and actually the last one that I'm seeing is, is albacore tuna usually better quality in terms of mercury levels? Um, you know, let me, if you guys don't mind, I don't memorize that list, but I did actually pull it up this morning on my phone so that it would be the first thing I looked at. So let's see here on my, and I'm literally on uh, the FDA's website. Maybe you can see there's this cool little chart here. So if I'm looking at tuna, slipjack is going to be the one with the lowest amounts. So that's really one of the ones that the FDA says for mercury levels, okay to eat two to three times a week. Um, albacore is a considered a good choice, and that's going to be about one serving a week. Albacore along with yellowfin tuna fall into that good choice area. Big eye tuna, just as an FYI, is in a level to avoid or is a seafood to avoid if that's if mercury is a concern for you. So I've never seen big eye tuna as far as canned tuna. That's probably more of like a sushi grade type thing. Okay, good to know. And thank you for being prepared. Look at that. Okay, um, well now I'm just seeing thank yous and seeing thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you, looking forward to making some new things. So Yay, good. I hope I encouraged everybody to cook seafood. It's an amazing food product. I promise you so many great benefits. Really get those omega-3s. Like I said, some amazing research coming out about heart health, brain health, eye health. Like as we age, we know that omega-3s are going to be really important for us. So I encourage you to go out, try that seafood if that's your thing. If not, eat some algae, get a seafood or an algae salad today. Um, we have it in our sushi department. It's awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jenny. You've almost convinced me to try salmon. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I can get but... you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate your time and your expertise, and I will send around that um, flyer that she was talking about, maybe today or tomorrow, next time I have access to email. And if you're calling in, give me a phone call. I'm at 858-7605. I'm happy to put one of those in the mail to you. So with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Wait, Katie, can I do make one more recommendation for the comment Please, about 
for the comment about the seafood does not taste like restaurant quality. I would highly recommend, and there is a higher sodium level in this, but it, I would say if you're eating it once a week, based on what, uh, what else you're eating, the, the sodium intake could be balanced. We have frozen seafood entrees in our seafood department. One of them is like a salmon teriyaki and you literally cook it from frozen in the oven in the package and it comes out and it is a restaurant quality meal. So there's a salmon, there's a seafood chowder, there is a seafood risotto, which is to die for. I would highly recommend that it is the easiest way to incorporate seafood in balance your sodium intake with other food items, but they are a winner and they will taste restaurant quality every time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Maybe that's how I'll try it then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Bye, everyone. Thank you.